This episode of This Is My Bourbon Podcast is brought to you by The Restillery. just wanted to stop in here for a quick second before we got into the episode. Uh, First off, Happy New Year to everybody. Of course, hope that you had a wonderful New Year's Eve and that your year is getting off to a great start. As you can probably tell, uh, this is not our 2018 wrap-up episode. That is actually going to be coming out next week. We uh, have not had a chance yet to record that, so I just wanted to let you know of that. But... This episode is a whole lot of fun. I recorded it with Dave Jennings, who is Rarebird101, over on uh, uh, Instagram and Twitter, and um, he has this wonderful little blog. He is a huge wild turkey enthusiast. Um, you get to hear a lot about what he he feels about wild turkey and all the reasons that he is so uh, attracted to it as, as well, so... Hope you enjoyed this episode. Before we get into it, though, I wanted to also uh, talk about our sponsor, of course, The Restillery. Um, They are a wonderful company who build lamps out of used bourbon bottles. I have one uh, myself. Uh, It is a Blanton's bottle that sits on top of a barrel head and is surrounded by the Blanton's corks, which, of course, spell out the name Blanton's. So uh, definitely go and check them out. They are at The Restillery over on all the social media channels, so be sure to give them a follow and everything. Let them know I sent you. With that, we are going to hop right into the episode, so I hope you enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of This Is My Bourbon Podcast. I'm Perry, and I'm your host, and I'm so happy to have you guys along for this really awesome episode that has been kind of in the works for a little while and finally got around to uh, making this a reality. And I'm super stoked to have this special guest on. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dave, or as you might know him, Rarebird101. Dave, welcome to the show, man. Hey, how's it going, everybody? (laughs) So uh, for some of you, this is actually going to be a little bit of a retread because we are filming this live via Google Hangouts for our patrons. So patreon.com slash my bourbon podcast uh, is where you can actually see the recording of this episode if you want to do just that. So please go ahead and go check that out if you are at all interested. Um, but for anybody who's here for the first time, welcome in. Happen to ha- happy to have you, rather. Um, so we're going to have a really great episode where we're just talking nothing but turkey. And maybe a little bit other other stuff, but we'll <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, but first, we got to start start out with uh, what what our warm up pour is. So, Dave, what are we warming up with? I've got just wild turkey one hundred and one, just regular old turkey one hundred and one. That's right, man. old faithful. This is a re- a recent bottle. That's great. Yeah, you were saying that you were uh, having some trouble finding 2018 bottles. That's right. right. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm not like I'm searching high and low for them because I know they'll come around eventually. But I did find a, a pint and some some little 100 milliliters. And uh, I'm always, you know, trying to figure out, you know, are the batches improving? Are they, you know, changing? And the only way to do that is to is to get out there and buy them and try them. So how, how has... 101 kind of evolved for you then has it gone uh, a more positive way or do you kind of find yourself yearning for the 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 old days of of turkey 101 yeah that's a tough question um you know things are going to change it's inevitable uh, it happens with all the producers uh you know heaven hill doesn't taste like heaven hill from the 90s and i mean it's just there's there's something that happened and there's a lot of different reasons you know that changed the profile over the years now, if I'm in the mood for a dusty wild turkey pour, then uh, there's hard to find. It's hard to find something similar, but dusty turkey. Um, but more often than not, uh, I prefer, you know, on a regular basis, the more modern profile. And then somewhere in between, you I, you have what I call the classic profile, which is kind of like the transition from the old dusty profile to the modern profile. And that time period, things can vary greatly. You can have some pours that that 
pretty much just tastes almost dusty. And then you have some that kind of have a modern edge to them. So they, they vary there. Um, on a, uh, like I said, on a more regular basis, I'm just looking for Russell's Reserve Single Barrel, Wild Turkey 101, Rare Breed 116.8. And those satisfy me just fine. <laughs> uh, just fine. Well, they're all great everyday, everyday sippers, you know. That's but right. At the same time, they're all so they're all so diverse in their their functionality. I mean, mm -hmm. whether it's you know neat pours or you're trying to kind of spruce up cocktails to make them a little bit more spirit forward, you know, I think that turkey is inevitably the most versatile bourbon out there. I would have to agree with that, and and it's not just because. I'm a fan of it because that's kind of what got me into it. I mean, sure. you've probably heard the story before. I've been on other podcasts and, 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 you know, it, it, it goes back to me chasing all of these highly sought after whiskeys and settling, settling for <laughs> wild Turkey 101 because, you sure. know, it's, it's there. And then, you know, I realized that God, you know, this is great. I mean, and it's not expensive, and it's everywhere. I mean, you can go to any restaurant, you know, and it's it's there, you yeah, know, absolutely. And, and it's uh, it's not hard to find. And it's just damn good, man. I mean, it's <laughs> that is no ifs, ands or buts about that. That's one, right? right. I mean, how many people how many people do you see or hear knock Wild Turkey 101? I, or let me rephrase that. How many experienced <laughs> experienced bourbon drinkers do you find knocking 101 it has got to be less than 10 percent. I mean, oh abs absolutely i mean yeah. it it's kind of the it it seems to me like it's kind of the dark horse mm -hmm. in in the the daily drinkers and more often than not when i get asked the question what's your daily drinker what are you sipping on just kind of as you know you're not thinking about it turkey 101 is my answer right right and and i I am, I'm getting more used to it, but I'm also typically pretty surprised by the looks that I tend to get from people mm -hmm. yeah. when I do say that. Right. And I, it, it's this really secret hidden gem that I, I think people are starting to catch on to a little bit more, too. I mean, especially during the, the bourbon boom. Right. But I, I think overall, you know, that I don't see this one going going away like some of our favorite daily drinkers have right i guess you're referring to the uh heaven hill bottled and bond see we were yeah. going to talk a little bit other <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean I, i'll be a, be honest with you i was a big fan of the old heaven hill bottled and bond which was not oh, wow. age dated you know the gold black red label uh that they discontinued a few years ago uh and i was a fan of that it was a very cheap you could buy a fifth for like twelve dollars or something yeah. and it was it's it's good stuff um but, uh, you know, things change. I understand that. And uh, the good news is, is that fans of, of either of the Heaven Hill Bottle and Bonds can pick up Wild Turkey 101 and you're going to get just as high quality, if not higher Absolutely. quality of a pour. It may be a little bit more expensive, but honestly, the maturity of, of uh, Wild Turkey 101 is, is frankly a little higher than, than the Heaven Hill Bottle and Bond. Yep. So. And, and and I agree with that too, and I especially like the fact. I mean, sure, it may be you know just one proof point higher, but you know th there's something about that 100 to 110 range that really does just sit so well on my palate. Uh, yep. And you know, at I I'm able to find it around here for 20 bucks a bottle. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I can't find anything that is as good as Turkey 101 is at that price point. I mean, it just, mm -hmm. it, it just doesn't exist. <laughs> right. You can find handles on sale. Sometimes you can find handles for 26, $27. Uh, I mean, that's just hard to beat. It, oh, it really is. Totally. Totally. So let's, uh, let's kind of get into a little bit of what we have planned. And part of this is going to be, you sent me mm -hmm. very graciously, this wonderful little flight of different turkey bottlings. Okay. And one of them, while we're on the topic of 101, I figure we'll go ahead and talk about this one. Mm -hmm. One of them was an, an 04 101. Mm -hmm. And I've had this on the show before. I've had it on a live stream before. And I'm just absolutely over the moon about it. I think it's fabulous. Mm -hmm. But what, what was it about this one that, it, uh, you know, made you say he needs to try this? Well, Actually, I had lucked out and found a store 
uh, that had a bunch of them. Uh, I say, I mean, I picked up probably six or so, Ooh. mostly leaders of, right. of different 2000s, one and one. And I, most of them were 04. Uh, and I had a few 05s. And then I found a bunch of uh, half pint 05s. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the 06 and the 07. Um, but the 04, uh, it, it has a nice little pinch of funk to it. I would say it's not dusty. You could call it dusty. It's, it's, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a 14, you know, year old bottle that's been I was sitting there. Say, what, what's the statute yeah. of limitations on dusties here? Like we, it, we, not we, to change the subject, but in my opinion, if something's been sitting there for 10 years or more, I think it's fair to call that dusty. <laughs> it may not that's be dusty fair, profile, too. but it's a dusty bottle. Um, uh, and it depends but, on, you know, if the people smoke in the store or, yeah, you know. that, that, that will, or if it's sitting in the sun, you don't want that. No, but, uh, no yeah, I, I, I thought that you would like it because it has a nice, what I call the classic profile to it. Um, and if you look at it just, just, just visually, it's darker, uh, than oh, absolutely. the one on one you pour now. You yeah. know, what that means exactly, you know, it, it probably means that there is some either A, some older juice in there, or B, it's because of that low entry proof uh, and there's a lot less dilution. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's the one or two of, of those things or, to, or both of them together. And Turkey's kind of famous for having changed their barrel entry proof multiple times over the Twice. past. Twice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Twice. So mm -hmm. ha have you been able to notice, you know, specific differences? Yes. And they've changed that? Okay, wait, so so what exactly, or, you know, kind of ballpark have you been able to notice about? <laughs> well, the, the 110 entry proof only happened for a year or so. So you're not really going to, you know, nail that down, you know, sure. to a specific expression or something. Sure. But if you want to talk about the, the original 107 entry proof that had been for the longest time, you know, going as far as I know back when it was JTS Brown, even the Rippy Distillery, uh, you had that 107 entry proof. It's possible that that was something unique that, that Jimmy did, but I, I know it's always been low. Um, and that changed uh, in 2004 to 110, and then in 2006 to 115, and that's where it's at now. Um, so mainly what you're going to find is that the older 107 entry proof gives you a little bit richer of a profile. Um, it's not what I would call the, you know, the end all be all of this is this is what made the dusty profile, because that's not true, because there there were a lot of releases, uh, you know, in the 2000s and even the early 2010s that were in that old entry proof. And they don't taste like dusty wild turkey. They don't taste like 70s or 80s or 90s sure. wild turkey. So you can't say it's just the entry proof. Um, but it does have, like I said, kind of a classic profile there. Um and then <laughs> as the entry proof was changed, speci more specifically in 2006, and you're drinking what we're drinking now, mm -hmm. which you find on the shelves now, you find a, just a, it's, it's not uh, younger, but it has a little, just a little bit more of a grain edge to it. It's not yeah. bad. Okay. Absolutely. It's just got more of a grain edge to it. Mm -hmm. Um, and it really depends on, on the on the year too. I mean, if you if you have something like decades, you're not really going to taste as much as what I call the modern profile. You're going to get more of a combination of the classic and uh, you know the modern, and that's because it has ten year in it, you know, and right. then it has the twenty year in there as well. So you get that that mix. But uh, the entry proof is still relatively low if you compare it to to Beam. Um, oh, absolutely. Or in some of the Buffalo Trace uh, mash bills, um, it, it's still a very, you know, low entry proof in comparison to some other uh, distilleries there. So um, I think the most interesting thing to me <clears throat> about wild turkey, specifically the bourbon, is that you have this one mash bill that creates such unique profiles. Right. Um, and, and it is just it's astounding, honestly. Yeah. Because you 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 can have such variance in the single barrels and, and good variance, not not bad variance. And you could have two Russell's Reserve single barrels bottled in the same year and taste completely different in many ways, you know? Absolutely. And and so Absolutely. I find that fascinating. And I to to kind of piggyback off of that too, I mean you know, th this is a mash bill that has stayed consistent 
for decades Mm -hmm. too. And so I I think what's so cool about Turkey specifically and and the way that they approach their whiskeys is that they're not going, well, let's, let's try a, let's try a weeded mash bill or try, you know, a, a, a super, super high rye recipe or anything. They're taking the same thing that's worked for forever Mm -hmm. and just experimenting with it. You right. know, and and I I always go back to this phrase um, and th- this is Turkey is the exact opposite embodiment of this phrase and it's you can't polish a turd and yeah. you know I, I think that Turkey is doing everything right to where you go they don't need to they don't have anything to fix right they don't have anything to fix right. but I, I do want to kind of back up a little bit because I I figured I'd ask you some more, you know, general questions and uh, get get to know you a little bit more as a bourbon drinker, too. So one of the things, of course, that I like to ask people who are, are new to the show is how'd you get into bourbon? OK, well, uh, it's it's something I've enjoyed for years uh, casually, um, you know, going back to my college years in the 90s. Uh, I always appreciated like a Jim and Coke or a Jack and Coke or something like that. It was never a straight pour. Um but bourbon's always been, you know, I, I've never been one into vodka or gin or any of these types of things, you know. So <laughs> it, it, I guess it's the Southern boy in me. But, uh, you know, I've always appreciated that. And uh, so, you know, go out to eat or whatever, you know, I'd get, you know, Jim and Coke or something. Sure. Uh, but uh, I, it was about five years ago or so, and I was at my brother-in-law's house, and, and he he poured a uh, – it was one of these limited edition Crown Royal whiskeys uh, over the rocks – yeah, I'd never really taken whiskey like that before. Prior to that, it was like maybe shots in college or like I said, mixed <laughs> drinks, you know, and uh, right? never even been into cocktails really. <laughs> um, so uh, I was like, wow, this is, this is good. You know, I, I, I like this. And so I got into just whiskey in general. I started exploring, you know, scotch, Irish, blended whiskeys. Um, and then I, I circled back to, bourbon, which kind of was where I started. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that there was a lot more to bourbon than just Jim White label. Um, And and so you start buying, and I would start with pints and this kind of thing, uh, really dipping my toes in. Then I got into chasing some of the more sought after ones. Um, But I would just go back to Turkey because you could just get a pint of it. Like if you were buying a bottle of something like mid shelf, you know, Elijah Craig or something, you would check out and you'd say, well, just, uh, you know, I'll just get a wild turkey 101 and throw in with it. And I just kept coming back to it, you know? Yeah. And uh, so a couple years ago, I was online and somebody had asked me if I'd ever tried dusty turkey. <clears throat> of course, I had not. Uh, I mean, I'd had wild turkey in college, <laughs> but it was not like that. Um, Everybody had turkey in college. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was like, wow, this is excellent. You know, like it was just. Yeah. It was better than anything I had found to date, you know, on the shelves. Um, and so it kind of just set me off on this journey because uh, the, my immediate thing was to try to find something comparable that you could find retail at the store, which is which is unrealistic. I mean, you're not going to, you know, unless you luck out and find some honey hole that has some old bottles sitting there, you're not going to find it in a modern release. But what I did find, what I did find was that I appreciated the modern expressions for what they were. And, uh, and then I got into researching the brand um, and I was just soaking it up, reading everything I could, watching videos on YouTube. And I realized that there was so much more to wild turkey than bourbon. Um, the story, you know, of the Russells, uh, you know, and Jimmy and how he got started and how he, like you said, that mash bill that never changed, that it never changed because Jimmy would never change it, you know? Right. And uh, it, it just... It was a really just a lot. There's a lot there. And and then also like the fact that wild turkey is and you kind of touched on this briefly where people kind of give you the looks. Wild turkey is kind of the underdog, you know, absolutely. Um, to at least to the average American. You know, it has kind of a reputation that's not deserved. Um, <laughs> and I kind of like that. I kind of like being on the underdog side a little bit. Um all those things combined, but mainly the profiles. I just enjoy it. You know how it tastes. So that's kind of where I started. You know, my bourbon journey was, you know, in college and mixed drinks and this type of thing. And then working into just whiskey in general 
and then finding wild turkey and discovering that it was it was for me it's it's what i love to kind of touch on one of the points that you just made there about turkey being the underdog turkey's getting a lot more publicity now there's this guy that blogs about it i know (laughs) (laughs) well regardless of that that one guy there's also you know star power attached to it that's true i mean matthew mcconaughey is you know, becoming, you know, for for lack of a better phrase, the face of the brand right now. Is that something that excites you in terms of being a turkey drinker, that more people are getting exposure to it? Or, you know, do, do, does it kind of worry you about the, the future of the brand? I don't worry about it one bit. I think that <laughs> I, I, I really don't. And here's why I don't worry about it, because I know it's in good hands. I know as long as Jimmy, Eddie or Bruce has their hands on the wheel, there is nothing to worry about there. Amen. What McConaughey does is bring a new audience in. And the the uh, expressions that he's offering them are not necessarily expressions that I'm reaching for every day. Long Branch, you know, the 81 Proof, just wild turkey, straight bourbon. Sure. Uh, he's reaching out to a, a new audience. He's reaching out to... 20s, you know, people in their 20s. He's reaching out to, uh, you know, a female audience that that probably would have never given Wild Turkey the the time of day in the past. Sure. Um, There's plenty of female bourbon enthusiasts, and they love Wild Turkey, but I'm talking about a different, you know, demographic. Um, And I think that uh, he's kind of breaking new ground there for the brand, and I think that's a great thing because the better the brand does – uh, the more that Wild Turkey will be able to get into doing new and better things. Not that I want them to go off and do crazy experimentation, <laughs> this kind of stuff, but, but things like Revival is just one example of something experimental, but done tastefully. And in the, uh, they didn't really just go off the road. I mean, they stayed yeah. on that Wild Turkey road. It just kind of changed things a little bit. For, and it was great, you know. Wild yeah. Wild was awesome. I completely agree with you. <laughs> and, and so that that that's that's what I like. And McConaughey bringing that attention to the brand, you know, it helps. You know, of course, it's going to profit. It's going to do better, and they'll be able to do more things with that. But as long as Eddie, Jimmy, you know, uh, Bruce are, are are there, I think that we've got nothing to worry about. And I've been particularly impressed with Bruce lately. Uh, like oh, that, that, that dad's drinking bourbon podcast. Mm-hmm. With him. Uh, and then the podcast that he did with uh, one nation under whiskey, um, both of those excellent. And he just, yeah. you know, really, if you haven't, I know you said you, you listened to the dad's drinking bourbon. One, but, I have. But yeah. Catch the one nation under whiskey because sure. there's a great, he talks about Jaretta, you know, his, his grandma um, in there. And it, it's just, just it just really paints this picture it, it, and it's not a fabrication it's like you yeah. get this inside view of, of what it's like to be you know in that inner circle of the russells and it's so genuine you know and it's like kind of like the genuine quality of the whiskey just is is blended with the genuine quality of the russells they're kind of one in the same absolutely yeah you know? while, while we're on the topic of bruce too i i have to ask and and actually, the topic of revival too. Ten years ago, do you think that a product like revival could have existed without one Bruce Russell? Because it seems like he had a huge hand in that becoming something again. The, the like, answer is yes and no, and here's why: <laughs> there was a product like that ten years ago, and it was called Sherry Signature. Um, <clears throat> it was a wild turkey release where Jimmy had. Uh, essentially, I don't know if it was so much sherry finished, it was sherry enhanced, so it could have been, you know, had some <laughs> sherry in it. I don't know exactly. I haven't been able to get the exact story on what sure. made sherry. But sure. it was a, it was like, you know, an 80 proof, you know, wild turkey. that, uh, And it was a European release. Um, and that was one of the inspirations for, uh, you know, Revival. Now, Eddie admits that, that sherry signature is not that great. but he <laughs> but, but he took that and said, you know, I'm going to actually – take this as inspiration and, and make something that is. Yeah. And he did really well. Now, 
reason why I say no, because I said yes and no, I think that, and I, I don't want to talk you know, bad about uh, corporate ownership, but I think that they reached a point in the 2000s that, that Pernod gave up um, on Wild Turkey. I think that they were kind of done with the brand. Obviously, they sold it, you know, because because Campari purchased them. Right. And, uh, <clears throat> but I think that they had kind of had their their time with Wild Turkey. And I think that anything that, that Eddie brought forward as far as new ideas just really weren't given any type of attention. So you can see that once Campari uh, has ownership of the brand, things change almost overnight. Um, the, the releases start coming out, and, and people didn't notice this, but like Wild Turkey 81, okay, was a new release. I mean, prior to 2011 or so, there was Wild Turkey 80 proof. Right. And it really wasn't that great of a product. A lot of people chase these 80 proof dusties. I'll tell you, they aren't that great. You, you, there, there are some that are good, and there are some that are kind of like, eh, I don't know about this. You know, <laughs> you, 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 they're very variant there. Now, the 101 is rock solid, but it, and it varies some, but it varies some at a higher quality level. The 80 proof is, is hit or miss. And I'm not the first one to say that or notice it either. Um, you know, Chuck Calgary was hard on, on the 80 proof. And there were a lot of people. And even Eddie, like I said, Eddie admits it. The 80 proof could have been better. When he made the 81 proof, sure, it's it's an 81 proof uh, Kentucky Straight Bourbon whiskey that's probably four to six years or so. But it holds its own with Jim White Label, which is the most important thing. Because Jim White yeah. Label is the most, is, it's the highest selling bourbon in the world. So, you, you know, that is Wild Turkey's white label. Okay. So that was 2011. That came out. Then, you know, you had Russell's Reserve Single Barrel come out around 2013. Um, huge release. I mean, you know, you had Wild Turkey Kentucky Spirit prior to that, which was the, the single barrel. But now you've got this 110 proof, non chill filtered, you know, uh, single barrel product. Right. And it, to, to, my, to this day now, I mean, since that's come out, I mean, that's pretty much my favorite wild turkey product is, is Russell's Reserve Single Barrel. If somebody said, what's your favorite and I, that I can go get, you know, it's going to be Russell's Reserve Single Barrel. That's a new product. And then you see uh, different releases. Uh, you know, Diamond was more for, for Jimmy's anniversary, but you have this Master's Keep series, uh, Long Branch. Um, you have the Single Barrel Rye. Um, yeah. So there are a bunch of things that all, you know, Campari comes in and they just kind of, they, they put an, an actual investment in. They got a new visitor center. They got a new distillery. I mean, it just, it, it they made a huge difference. They, they took yeah. it to the next level, and, and Renault was just not doing that. Again, I'm not trying to speak bad about you know I'm sure they had their reasons, but uh, but I have to commend Campari on that because they, they saw something there. You know, and I know a lot of people, they... They, they don't like corporate ownership and this, but it's just a fact of the matter. And it's just what happens. You, you have very few privately owned distilleries. Um, and so it's just, you need that cash, you know, to be able to do new things. Um, and uh, I think that Campari has done an excellent job with that. I, I, I totally agree with you. And I have to ask you too, what, what's a, as the Turkey super fan, what's your relationship like with Campari? I think it's pretty good. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, I, 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 I get along very well with, with the state manager and I get, get along very well with, with, uh, one of the vice presidents for the, for the company on the national level. And I kind of, I have to keep a distance somewhat cause you know, I, I have to be a critic, you know, and I have to be honest. And matter of fact, the other night I, I sent an email to Campari and I said, I just want to let you know, I appreciate all that you do for wild Turkey, but I'm going to have to tell you that, you know, I, I really, I value that you let me be honest. And I've been very tough over the last few weeks on the Kentucky spirit bottle. I knew that's where you were going with that. And I'm going to remain <laughs> tough on it because yeah. it sucks. I mean, I'm just going to say it. The I new design is awful. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I said, you know, I really appreciate you allowing me, you know, to be honest like that because, you know, my blog is kind of unique. I mean, a lot of the other whiskey blogs there, some of them are just absolutely great, but they, 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 they cover a massive catalog, even if it's niched in bourbon, you know, yeah. they have, they have a massive catalog there from craft to, to, to high end. But I'm so dedicated to wild Turkey that, you know, I worry sometimes like, you know, am I going to say the wrong thing? You know, and this goes away. And thankfully, 
you know, they have been very, very kind to me um, and respectful of my uh, honesty, even when sometimes it's not something that they probably don't want to hear. Yeah. I mean, if sure. it's something they don't want to hear. So, um, you know, I just try to be as honest and fair as I can and call it like I see it. Um, and I think, too, the fact that they have somebody like you to, in essence, kind of keep them in check to allow them to kind of take a step back and go, well, what worked about this? What didn't work about mm -hmm. this? You know, and it, at it, at its basis level, every product that gets released by a distillery is in essence, an experiment, mm -hmm. you know, what, what's going to work in the market. Cause you don't know how that's going to, how, how it's going to be reacted to until it's actually out there in the world. That's a good point. And, mm -hmm. and, and the fact that they have somebody like you, to step up and say, you know, this just wasn't your best effort mm -hmm. or this was incredible. Absolutely blew my expectations out of the water. You know, that you, you're doing, you're doing the bourbon drinkers work here by, you know, being honest. And, you know, I, I'm sure that you face your critics too, you know, at, even as big of a Turkey super fan as you are, I know that there've got to be people out there who go, you know, well, he's, you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And, and well, I, I, what you say is very kind. I appreciate that period. I, I, I do have uh, the occasional person that gets unhappy with me for whatever reason. Sometimes it's just pure trolling and I don't even pay <laughs> those folks attention. I know you've dealt with stuff like that before. You had to shut uh, down a, very a recent. podcast one time with that. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, but, uh, you know, recently, I, this past week, I had a review of a uh, Russell's Reserve single barrel, um, and there was someone that commented on it, and he was a little bit upset, like, well, oh, great, another review of a bottle I'll never be able to find, and, you know, kind of went off, like, because I had given some Rick House descriptions of traits that I find in different Rick Houses. He's like, yeah, now everybody's going to be chasing these Rick Houses, and I really appreciate you doing that or whatever. And there was some sarcasm to it. It wasn't, it wasn't mean. It wasn't nasty. And I appreciate the person commenting. Um, but the fact of the matter is, you know, I, I review things that come to me that I find interesting. You know, I have to, I have to want to write about it. I can't sure. force myself to write. So you know, it's not like I sit sit out and have this schedule for the year. Like these are the bourbons I'm going to review this year. Um, you know, if something comes my way and I taste it, whether I don't like it or do like it, or I find something interesting about it, and I, I'm, a, I'm compelled to write about it, I'm going to. Yeah. And that that bottle that I reviewed was actually something that I'd been wanting to write about for a while. I just had some other things come up that, that kind of kept me from doing that. And another thing, too, about reviewing single barrels is that, yes, you may not be able to find that exact, that exact single barrel. I could use... The argument that this person had against Blanton's, I could use it against Elmer T. Lee. Absolutely. I could use it against any of these things that are single barrel. And I could say, wait a minute, any blog post that's reviewing the single barrel bourbon whiskey, you're not going to be able to find that exact one, probably right. not, you know, especially if right. you're halfway across the country. Um, it's to give you an idea of what that expression can offer on a different day, on a different bottle, from a different vendor, from a different Rick House. It just, it, it's, to me, I appreciate reviews of whiskeys that I'm never going to have just because I want to know what they taste like. You know, some of these legendary pours, these Willet pours and stuff like that, I enjoy reading the reviews of them because I'm never going to taste them. I'm certainly never going to own them. <laughs> and I'm like, so what does it taste like? You know, and I love it when folks give their notes and descriptions and that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, I kind of enjoy it through them, you know, sure. and I think there are people that that like that. And so that's why I write about things that you may never be able to taste. And I don't hold it against that person comment. And I welcome any comments on my website. And I'll be glad to discuss, you know, any issues folks have. Um, I love having, you know, debates as long as they sure. stay, you know, friendly. Mm -hmm. Civil, right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And again, too, I just just to kind of harp on and, you know, maybe at some point I'll, I'll get off of the Rare Bird 101 high horse, but... You know, I, it, it speaks volumes to your character, too, that, again, you are able to step back, too, and, and understand where you sit as a reviewer uh, of this product, too. And, and, and a, it can, can still maintain conversation with people who may not be willing to have the same kind of conversations that you are. Well, I, I appreciate it. I just try to, 
I feel like, and I, and I briefly mentioned this the last time I was on Bourbon Pursuit, is I feel like there's more good in the hobby than bad. Um, yeah. You're going to have some sour folks every once in a while, and they may have their reasons, and there may be reasons I don't, I don't know about. Um, but uh, I think for the most, uh, it's very positive. It's very friendly. Um, I have Definitely. far more fun conversations and, and in-depth, you know, informative conversations than I do you know, negative conversations. Um, and so, you know, if it happens every once in a while, that's fine. Uh, you know, we'll just, we'll give it a go and, sure. and see if we can iron it out. And if not, you know, you go your way, I'll go mine. And yes, sir. I'll just sit my 101. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of sipping, let's, let's pour something. Okay. Out. All right. Well, well, I, I, I'm curious. I, I'm going to kind of let you be the guide on this because you sent me two similar pours. Okay. I have a feeling that they're going to be pretty different. So we could go about this one of two ways and it kind of depends on how many glasses you have in front of you. Okay. Um, if you've got two glasses, <clears throat> I say we pour both of these two wrestles side by side so we can kind of compare them a little bit. Well, I tell you what, I don't have the, any, any of the O three three that I sent you. Oh, really? Um, <laughs> so you save that, you save that. Um, Great. For a special time, but sure. I have the 05 okay. Muscles Reserve ten year, which which looks like this. Oh, now, there were there were several years with this label. Mm -hmm. This one is unique. It does not have the embossing on the glass. Uh, and starting mid two thousand six, they said Jimmy Russell here. Right, it does not have that. It has a black ink code on the back to let you know it's two thousand five. This is uh, prior to the transition in bottling facilities when it was moved to Arkansas. This is a different whiskey than you're going to find in mid-2006 forward. This is essentially what I think is underproofed 101.12 year. I think this is whiskey that was wow. made for 101.12 that just did not hit that 101 mark because that low entry proof. So you're going to find a very dusty pour um, with a lot of depth. And you can just look at the color of this and how dark it is for 90 proof is just amazing. Oh, yeah. Um and I'm not the only one that that is aware of this. This is this is kind of a a, a fan favorite here for a lot of folks. <laughs> and I know that uh I got to get this wiped off here. I know that uh Dixon Deadman for example, he's a big, you know, uh, fan of this one. Yes, he is. He and specifically I think, talked about that when I had him on the show. Did he? Okay, yes. okay. I need to check that out. Oh, um, you 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 really should. Dixon's a great guy. He is. Oh, um, I love him to death. But you can just, I mean, immediately, you know, and you probably can can tell there are some similes, similarities to the 04, 101 that you have, but it's, it's yeah. richer and there's a lot more butterscotch in this. It's yes. like a I, absolutely. heavy it's, butterscotch. It's the sweetness that kind of separates it from a lot of, mm -hmm. you know, the, the turkey pours that, that are around today. But mm -hmm. at the same time, they're, uh, like you talked about that like dustiness and it does kind of have that kind of dusty funk to it on the nose heavy bit. heavy yeah yeah i i, I mean it's it, i i would be hesitant to say if i didn't know what year it was from mm -hmm. that it weren't from even you know at the earliest the early 90s mm -hmm. you know i yeah. mean it, it, it maintains a lot of that dusty funk. this to me is better than i have some 1018s uh from the mid 90s export 1018s from the mid 90s particularly 93, 94, this is better than that. And this is just, to me, this is one of my favorite wild turkeys, and it can still be found. Well, maybe not now, <laughs> <laughs> but it can still be not found. after this episode. I found some, you know, that were 30 bucks on the shelf. Uh, just, I Man. found, yeah, it's, it's uh, and, I, and there are some 06s like this too, but you have to be careful. It's early 06 has the non-embossed glass and the black coat on the back label. Those are good. But those fives are guaranteed like this. So, And this is fantastic. It is, I, isn't it? I, I mean, it's so funny because the nose is where all of that dustiness mm -hmm. is present. But once it gets to the palate, it's not quite there as much. Right. It's still a little present, but it takes a back seat to the, the rest of these really rich flavors mm -hmm. that are present. And I, I think this is an absolutely fabulous expression of, of Turkey and I can understand why people 
covet this in the, yeah. in the way that they do. It's a great, it's a great, it almost has a, um, one thing I've noticed too about there are some of the early 90s 1018s, like 91 and 92, they have like this little tinge of, it's it's almost like a port finish. Yeah. And this has, it has kind of like on the palette, there is like this kind of like a port finish. It's really strange. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's, you know, if I were to taste this blind, that would kind of be on my mind. I'd be like, wait a minute, was this cask finish or something? <laughs> you know, it just has a lot of flavor to it, you know. And like I have some Armagnacs, and this has a very Armagnac like quality to it. Yeah. Again, that that grape kind of thing that I don't it's raisins, you know, there there's some some raisins or plums, more like plums, yes. heavy Absolutely. plum in this. It's just it's excellent. I I tend to identify those um those quote unquote grapey notes mm -hmm. as more of the oakiness. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm totally on board with you. It's just I it's like sweet way, oak. Yeah. Absolutely. Sweet musty oak. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is so good. Yeah. Man. It's <laughs> I'm, excellent. I'm, I'm trying to process it too and in, in <laughs> talking about it. So while while I'm processing, I have to ask you, you know, you the, every every way that you present yourself as a turkey drinker everything that you say in reference to your experiences with wild Turkey as a brand kind of lends itself to this notion that, you know, a little bit more about Turkey than most folks do. So are you a wild Turkey expert? I'm not an expert. I don't want to, <laughs> I, I don't want that title. Um, we I, had I know, this conversation recently I, too, I, but I, know, I wanted to establish yeah. this on the podcast. <laughs> you know, I, I'm no Minnick. I'm no Michael Beach. You know, I'm no Chuck Cowdery. Um, I, I'm a I'm a huge fan. Uh, if anything, I, I'll accept I'm a wild turkey researcher because uh, I do heavily research it, um, and I'm you know working on a on a book right now, so I'm really dug into that. Are you um, really? Yeah, I really am. Oh and, my gosh, uh, man, that's so yeah, exciting. I'm, yeah, I'm over halfway into it, and uh, it's it's there's a lot there. I, I will tell you that there's some really interesting history early on that I think a lot of folks are going to take from when they when they finally get to read it. But um, and it's not just history. I've got a section on appreciation and this type of thing, so it sure. goes through the different expressions and stuff. But um, I'll I'll take researcher. I'll take super fan. I don't want to say expert because the real experts are, are Jimmy and Eddie and Bruce, uh, you know, and, and even Joanne. I mean, it, the Russells, I mean, they, they're there. They learn, you know, all this stuff from, from a very early age and they have all this experience and, and hands on. And, and, and there's a culture there that, you know, I'm really not even privy to. And, and I hope to be a part of that one day. I hope to, to go and, and, and meet all the different folks that, that work there and their jobs and, I really I have a lot of research planned for next year to finish up my book, and I want to kind of really dig in and 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 get to know everybody in their different positions and what they do and how, what's the daily workflow and and um, <clears throat> so I'm no expert I'm no expert <laughs> there there are plenty and there's plenty of people that uh, you know blog and write stuff that 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 probably know a lot more than me about it um, but they just they have so much in their brain with other distilleries that you sure. know. You know, it's like they have a, a, a perfect memory, but they don't have total recall or whatever you want to say. You know, it's like I'm sure it's in there. They just you know, <laughs> it's not what they focus on. All right. So you you, you just confirmed that sometime next year you're going to be coming up to Kentucky. So I'm going to go True. ahead and establish a formal invitation to have you on the show. Oh, awesome. In person and or just hang out and have a couple of okay. You know, I okay. mean, regardless, that, that is going to happen when you, okay. when you come up here. Great. Um, so. Yeah, I'm I'm incredibly excited about the book now that I know that that's something that's in the works because I, I, you know, I always enjoy reading your your posts and, and you know, seeing what your insights are into Turkey, not just as a, a product, but, you know, the brand as a whole and the culture and everything. So that's. Well, thank you. I, 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 my, my goal is to, you know, we did some special things for Jimmy and Eddie for the 101 anniversary um, and. I was trying to think of what when what what would be special what would be special next year for Jimmy's 65th, and I think that book, if I could get it finished, I think that would be you know just just the perfect thing 
to have for his 65th anniversary because I, I really want to make sure that I get his sign off on it. I want to make sure that it covers the topics that he wants to talk about, what, what yeah. he wants, you know, in there. And uh, it would be nice to have that finished by then. Um, I've yeah. also got some barrel uh, picks planned for, for next year. And I've got some themes already decided. I'm not going to spoil them because, you That's know. Okay. That's okay. That's okay. I've got some themes there that I'm going to be working <laughs> on. Uh, and so uh, really looking forward to, to what's to come there. Well, I, I hate to I hate to kind of dampen the mood here a little bit. Okay. But you, you brought up the the special things that you did this year for the 101st anniversary, mm-hmm. combined anniversary. And one of them was the one in a century barrel pick. Right, right. I got I got it right here if, if folks want to see it. Right oh, there. yes. Yeah. I love that label. I love the throwback <laughs> to the cheesy gold foil uh, style. It's just... I can't take complete credit for that. that that's uh, okay. That's okay. Know, I'm just, I I'm had, just I expressing my... I had a couple friends <laughs> yeah, help with that, and they did a great job coming up with it and, and designing it. Uh, yeah. But uh, the only thing I can take credit for is the one in the century. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I know where you're going with this, the, yeah, the well, secondary let, flips. Yeah, yeah let, let, to, to kind of give people a little bit of a background, too. So this was a single barrel that you and a, a team of turkey fans picked in honor of this year being a combined 101 years uh, of of em- employment or service, I guess, at Wild Turkey between Jimmy and Eddie Russell. Mm-hmm. And one in a century was it that was your pick for for this mm-hmm. and unfortunately it has kind of gained some negative traction in terms of where it's gone in its life past its intention yeah right and that's a that's a nice way of saying that people have flipped it on the secondary market yeah. and you were very unhappy about understandably so very unhappy about that yeah i i well, it, to to start back from the beginning, uh, I had decided early on that I was going to do something for the one one anniversary because Campari didn't really have anything planned for it. And in their defense, they had a lot of changes going on this year. They moved from San Francisco to New York. They lost some key personnel in that in that move. Um, so I, I'm not I'm not coming down on them, and I'm not defending them. I'm just saying it is what it is. Um, so I decided I'm going to if I pick a barrel this year. I'm going to make the theme of it the 101 anniversary. And uh, some friends of mine, Bryant and Ryan, we worked together on a label. The barrel was actually picked by me and Adam Howard of Lexington Beverage Outlet uh, in Columbia, South Carolina, with Eddie. Okay, so Mm -hmm. it was three people picking the barrel, but there were other people involved in in the design. Um, And then I had Ben, who also uh, helped out uh, in the actual printing, and he did a great job because, man, does it not look like an actual cheesy gold foil label. It it's really great. does. It it's really cool. does. And uh, caught me so, off guard the first time I saw it. I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> it's cool, but uh, you know, most of them were reserved for patrons. They're my Patreon site, and uh, you know, so the majority of them were eaten up that way. We had, uh, you know, a few cases at the store, and we expected them to last a couple days at least. Um, and, you know, the, the store manager was very careful to make sure that, you know, people just didn't come in there and clean out cases and this kind of stuff. Right. And I think the most someone left with was two bottles. Um, but uh, they were gone in like about three hours or something like before people could even get to their lunch breaks to like get out and get them. They had already disappeared. <clears throat> and, you know, at first I'm thinking, well, let's just hope folks that got the folks that did get them were ones that really wanted them. And uh, the first day went by and I thought, okay, we're we're okay. Then that next day was when they started going up on Facebook. And, you know, uh, I can't do anything about the secondary, but the thing that really bothered me the most, and I know it bothered several other people as well, was that uh, one of the posts had Eddie, we had give, I had given Eddie a bottle of it uh, just as a thank you, you know, for for the day we had. And, um, I they had the used that picture. About, too. Yeah, they had used that exact picture. Like you know, you know, Eddie apparently loves it, you know, or something, and it, it made it a sales pitch, and uh, that was just not cool. I did not, I did not like that at all. Um, you say that was a, outrageous, you know. You say that with a smile on your face, but I, 
can totally hear and and feel just the the frustration behind that. And it was at, at the time it was rough. I mean, I, I've I've dealt, I've put it behind me now. I've moved on, so I'm I'm more positive tonight. But at the time it was it was quite devastating enough to make me. You know, I normally post on Tuesdays. You know, my blog posts are usually every Tuesday. And I stayed up. I mean, it was bothering me so bad. I was sick as well. But I stayed up Saturday night to like two in the morning. I mean, I was just typing away. And I'm like, you know, I'm just going to – I put off doing something about it. I'd made some comments on Reddit. I'd made some comments on Instagram. Uh, but I had never – I had not sat down and addressed it formally. And it had weighed on me. And I was like – after that second posting of one for sale, I was like, I really just need to do something about yeah. this. And uh, it just, I opened the floodgates, you know, I sat down and I was just to do, do, do typing away and I was up like two in the morning. I, I just typed that all in one sitting. Um, of course, uh, Joshua had done the, uh, the review there and, and I copied and pasted yeah, that in. Right. But, uh, and I thought Joshua did a very fair assessment of it. I agree. Um, and, and, and the whole point was to illustrate that, you know, there were multiple things wrong with that flip. The Eddie picture was one thing that was just awful. The price was awful. But the, the thing that really blew my mind was that nobody had even tasted the damn thing. Like right. they had not. I mean, it's like, what are you doing? You know, mm -hmm. and uh, I wanted someone to see another person's interpretation of what it tasted like to them because it's not typical turkey. It doesn't taste like anything amazing. It's not, you know, decades or anything like that, you know. Um, it had some favorable favorable reviews this week on on Reddit, and I was really happy to see that. But I, I expect some unfavorable reviews too. It's a very polarizing barrel pick. It really is. I went for something crazy, um, but uh, you know, it just. Uh, I guess that's just what we're in now. We're in this thing where people are flipping single barrels because they have a sticker on them or because they have wax on the top or they have a dog tag <laughs> or I don't know, you know, but I did the design I had was purely out of appreciation for Eddie and Jimmy. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and the ones I'm going to be doing next year are going to be the same way. I'm going to make sure that whatever I stick on a, on a bottle that has my name or logo or website on it or anything like that, it is going to be respectful to the brand. Um, it's going to be something I can be proud of. It's not going to be a money grab or a sticker game or any of this kind of stuff like that. And, and, and you have my promise on that, whatever I put on there. And then I'm also going to make sure that, you know, if it has anything related to Ru the Russells or Wild Turkey, you know, I'm going to make sure that, that they're okay with it. Because yeah. at the end of the, the day, you know, it, it's their product and their name on the line. Absolutely. You know? So Absolutely. I'm not going to go glamming it up, you know, for some profits. It's uh, <laughs> just not going to do that, you know, disrespectful. Uh, and and I, I completely agree with you. And honestly, when I first, when I first saw that this at, 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 at its basis level, special bottle, mm -hmm was being flipped on secondary in the the situation that it was and at the price that it was it kind of it kind of broke my heart a little bit because it as much fun as we have with the the bourbon community as much as we invest into it and you know as as great as it can be at times that is kind of the 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 black spot on it mhm mm and, you know, I mean, it, it just kind of showed me uh, that, that it's not always, it's not always roses. Right. It was a low point. It wasn't the lowest. I think there's been some other shady stuff oh, that's yes. happened, <laughs> but it was a low, <laughs> lower point. Um, and I, like I said, I've gotten it behind me, but, but I, I, I understand exactly what you mean. Cause the first person, cause I'm not on Facebook. Someone messaged right. me a picture of it and I saw it and I was just like. Oh, damn, here it goes, you know. <laughs> and uh, I thought that maybe this will be the only one, and sure enough, it wasn't. Um, but I hate it because that bottle that that individual didn't want or didn't want for the right reason. He wanted it for the money. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. That bottle or those two bottles or three or however, in, however many ended up doing this, um, those wanted, you know, 
there were other people that wanted those bottles is, is the best way for me to say that. There were other people who genuinely wanted them. Right. And, and, and it just, <laughs> I raised my hand for anybody not watching them. <laughs> it, it's sad. It, it's sad because I, I can't tell you period. I mean, my inbox, it, you know, and I'm not trying to, to boast or anything, but my inbox, my inbox blew up yeah. when that the thing sure hit. And, and, I'm sure it did. And, and, and I had to tell so many people, no, that it, it was devastating. Cause you know, you want to yeah. be able to say, yeah, it was a short barrel. It was a shorter barrel than we expected. It wasn't the shortest barrel uh, this year because I've learned that there's a couple groups that have. There's one group that has a barrel pick as low as 42. Yep. Again, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Woodland Wine had that last year, and there's another group that has that this year. Um, so, but 102 is still pretty damn short for a yeah. for a barrel of bourbon. So, oh man, it could have been 101 and you could have had I know, it. I know. I know. Yeah. You don't know how many times I've it. thought about that. <laughs> that you know what? You could have you could have just told them to keep one bottle back and go, yep, it was great. It was just so serendipitous. I really wish someone had, you know. <laughs> I really wish someone had. That would have been awesome. Create your but, own legend, right? Yeah, yeah. But it, it worked out fine. But you know, yeah, it is what it is. I can't I can't do anything about the secondary. Of course not. Of course um, not. Well, let, just, let's let's just put it behind us then. How's right. That well, what I, what I think the lesson from it is this: I would love it if the next time someone does this, people just they just don't bite. You know, someone throws the hook out, they just dodge it. You know, yeah. and eventually, if that happens long enough, prices will go down to what they should be. Because you know, it wouldn't if the person had put it up there for eighty dollars. I don't think it would have bothered me that bad because it's like they went through the trouble to get it, you know, and now they've got to, you know, get it out to somebody, whatever like that. And I'm not saying there's a right or wrong to second it, whatever, you know, whatever. I'm just saying that $400 with a picture of Eddie on it is just dumb and (laughs) And disrespectful. And it wasn't even a picture of Eddie drinking it. It was just shaking hands. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, there there was no indication that he actually liked it. it right. I I understand what you're what you're getting at with that. Yeah, it, but, it it was just absurd. It was absurd, you know. And there were other people <laughs> that wanted it, so you know, whatever. But I'm not setting a value on my. To me, the bottles were sixty dollars. It's a sixty dollar yeah. barrel pick. Um, you know, anything above that, you're going to have to prove to me that it's worth the effort. You know, but uh, four hundred is just. Ain't no way. Ain't no way, man. <laughs> All right. So we'll, we'll, we'll put this behind us. Let's, yep. let's okay. lighten it up a little All bit. Right. I, I was thinking about this because, you know, I, I feel like this is a really great question to ask you. Okay. In particular, say you're given full control of the distillery. Okay. A day, a week, a month, however long it takes. You can decide barrel entry proof aging location all that good stuff walk us through how you do that what are you even able to walk us through how you do that i or really wouldn't do that much different i'll be i'm, I'm going to be straight honest with you Testament here's what i product. would do here's what i would do here's what i would do different i would keep the uh mash bill the same for the bourbon but i would have two different entry proofs and I, this is not Ooh. my original idea. This is Ooh. Bruce, okay? Yeah. I would have a run of 107, and that would be designed for certain expressions. And then I would have some with the 115 entry proof, and that would be for other expressions. And Bruce talked about hoping to experiment with that, and I hope he does because I think that will work very, very well. So keep the mash bill the same, Try two different entry proofs, and then those barrels go to different things. Okay, yeah, that is a great idea. The only other thing that I would change would be well, there's two things. Um, <laughs> I, I think that the rye, you know, I love Jimmy to death, but the very, very low rye, the barely legal rye, um, I think that. The younger rye, so we're talking like the 81 proof. Right. It just doesn't really shine with that recipe. I, I think, think that's that fair. If that's fair. they had a high rye, like MGP, like 95% rye, they could put out a four-year, you know, rye 
at 81 proof and it would taste pretty good. It would taste like yeah. bullet rye or something, you know? Absolutely. Um, so I think that maybe there should be two rye recipes. I think that there should be a, a rye recipe that's high rye and use it for the younger products. And then you could have some special edition, you know, sure products with it as well. Sure. And then you can keep Jimmy's classic barely legal rye recipe and continue on with the six and the single barrel and that kind of thing. Um, those would be two things I would look at. And I think that's a, a Bruce idea too. I think I, if I recall, Bruce mentioned something about experimenting with some higher rye, maybe not 95%, but higher yeah. than 51 and, and, and see where that goes. And I think both of those things would be great. I don't think they need to get into weeded stuff. I don't think they need to get into changing yeast, uh, any of this kind of stuff. I think it just needs to be, you know, have maybe a different entry proof on the bourbon side, you know, and then have maybe a different rye recipe for different, you know, rye products. I think those two things w- that would be things that change. The only other thing I'd change would be chill filtration. I think that they should do away with chill filtration on products that are over 100 proof. So the 101, the rare breed, you know, Wild Turkey Kentucky Spirit, uh-huh. Russell's Reserve single barrel is already NCF, but Russell's Reserve 10 could be NCF. Um, and, Sorry, and I just I just got lost in the the imagining Turkey 101 being non chill filtered. Yeah, imagine. I went, to, I went to a magical place there. <laughs> Thinking about you know, that. It, that. Yeah. I think that would be great. And, right. and there's no it's need for it. That, it's a purely a cosmetic thing. There's yep. no reason to have it over 86 proof um, other than, a, you know, for cosmetic reasons. Sure. Um, so those would be the things that, that I might change. And and I don't even know if it, it would be an experimentation thing. You know, maybe I'm wrong about the changing the rye recipe for the younger stuff. Maybe I'd, I'd try it be like, you know what? No, Jimmy was doing right the whole time. And I think that's what, Bruce is wanting to do. Bruce is wanting to kind of, he wants to stay again, like we had talked about in the past revival, stay on the Turkey road, yeah. but just kind of drive it a different way, you know, yeah. and, and see what happens there. Um, other than that, you know, I think what Jimmy has done, you know, since he started in 54 and then he was master distiller by 67, <clears throat> what he's done there has just, it's really it's, it's incomparable. I mean, there, there is, I cannot think of, there are plenty of great master distillers that have come and gone. And, and there's some that are, that are, that are still with us that are legendary, you know, living legends in a way. Um, but what Jimmy has done really, I, I don't think you can find another person that did it Jimmy's way and made it. You can find people that did it their own way um, and made it like Bill Samuels or uh, Elmer T. Lee. Yeah, um, and, and they, they approached the business from a different angle. You know, Elmer T. Mm-hmm. Lee, he got some investments from Jap- Japan with Age International and this type of thing, and he kept it alive. Bill Samuels, you know, did very well with marketing with Baker's Mark, um, and he had his own flair, his own way of doing things that was brilliant. No doubt about that. Yeah. What Jimmy did to survive that glut and to, and to get wild truck to where it is. They is just, he just kept doing things the way he had been taught to do it and right. he didn't stray from that. I mean, he did little things like honey and this type of stuff to kind of get some new people in. I don't think Jimmy sits around drinking American honey. I, I mean, <laughs> I don't really think he does either. <laughs> it was, it, 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 he did the, he did the 86 proof and the 80 proof. And these were ways to try to stay alive. These were things he had to do out of necessity. Right. Um, but for the most, he just kept doing things the Jimmy Russell way, which was the way that he had been taught, you know, from 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 Hughes and, and, and from Rippy. You know, this is how you do it. And Jimmy just stuck with it that way. And I'll be honest with you. I think I think that that Jimmy is a bourbon genius. I really do. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I think that he, he is so humble and he is so down to earth as a person that people miss it. But I think that deep inside of his mind, he sees things differently than than you or I do. I think that he just, he has this understanding. Uh, It's it's almost like a savant or something. I think that he just has this understanding of bourbon, like other people, like like, uh, Steve Jobs to computers or or Henry Ford to cars. I mean, Jim, it's like, it's like, you know, Jimmy is, 
bourbon. I mean, yeah. it, 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 it's really quite amazing. And well, I, I hope I, think, I can share that in, in the book. Yeah, I think that's too what lent Jimmy Russell not just being instrumental to bourbon surviving through the dark periods, but also the fact that he was willing to go out and, and market it mm-hmm. hit the when, road when, when nobody else mm-hmm. cared about it or, or Booker, cared to right. Do it. Exactly. Elmer, yeah. yeah. They, they and, went out and hit the road. And you know, what's so funny too. I I've said this, I've said this so many times. It amazes me that Jimmy and, and Booker and Elmer and, and um, you know, Parker beam, you know, mm-hmm. all independently of each other said, I want to go out and, and make this important again. And we owe, we owe it to them really now that the bourbon is doing as well as it is. And, mm-hmm. and that we are able to sit here on a Thursday night at, at 10 o'clock yeah. <laughs> and, and have these conversations, you know, I, it, the, we owe Jimmy so much. Sure. Bourbon being what it is in 2018. <clears throat> right. And, and, yeah. and he would not take full credit for it. No, he, he would wouldn't. do exactly no. what you said. He no. would, he would point, you know, uh, to Booker and he'd point to Elmer and Parker and he would say, you know, you know, we all did it because we helped each other. And he yep. said that before you can watch videos of Jimmy or listen to Jimmy or even ask Jimmy, you know, they help each, he, they help each other out is what, you know, he says, and they, yeah. they've done it in the past and they continue to do it now. Um, and uh, I think that there's, we have this enthusiast community and they have their own, you know, industry community and it's very close and tight knit and family oriented. And it's really yeah. unique. It really is. And, and I, I really, I'm sure there are other industries out there that have some similar traits but I can't think of one off the top. I of can't my either. Head. I can't hear one like <laughs> it's that. It's mostly cutthroat competition, you know, yep. with, with with mutual respect. This is a little bit different. This is this is you know. I think that when one hurts, the other one feels it, and yeah. there's this there's this pull to help them. And I don't think you see that in a lot of other industries. No, I don't think so either. You know, like with, with the, the Heaven Hill Fire and, and and the help that they were given, and and there's numerous examples, um, but uh, you don't see that. Very often no. in other industries, um, and, and I think that's one of the many cool things that make this hobby <laughs> so fun and exciting and and, and uh, rewarding to be involved in. Absolutely. Well, let let's wrap the the conversation up with uh, a, just two more questions, and then we'll move okay. into our review. What's the future of Turkey look like to you? Where, where do you I think see it, it looks going great. Here? I yeah. think it looks great. Yeah, and, and here's why. <clears throat> What Jimmy has established is something that, uh, you know, is going to last for years because he has Eddie and he has Bruce uh, carrying that torch, uh, very loyal to what he's established. Uh, They're different in their own Eddie's his own person, but he has great respect uh, for what Jimmy has established these all over these years. And then Bruce is the same way, but he has his own thing. So it's kind of like they they each have something that it's going to take to get to the next level. But it's all because of, you know, the bar that Jimmy set and the yeah. foundation that he laid, you know, for the brand. I see the future as nothing but uh, improving and getting better and more exciting. You have a company that that is actively involved uh, in investing into the brand. Yeah. Um, so all of the dominoes line up uh, in a way that uh, it's probably a bad example because dominoes fall, but what I'm saying is everything's <laughs> lined up for a great, for a great future. Um, you know, thanks Russell's reserve uh, 2005, <laughs> but uh, a bad example. Awesome. Yeah. But uh, it, it, everything's lined up for a great, for a great future. It really is. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I don't see anything, uh, immediately in the way in terms of the struggle or anything that's going to, uh, take the brain anywhere, but up. Yeah. All right. What, one last question, then we'll, we'll get this review knocked out, but you have one wild Turkey product that you can choose from mm-hmm. to have for the rest of your life. What is it? Why? 
Well, uh, I mentioned it once already, Russell's Reserve Single Barrel. I kind of figured that's where that was going. but uh, it, it, yeah. It's just, you know, hey, it's a modern expression. I, I'm assuming you, uh, in your question, you, you would allow me to go back in time if I wanted to. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. And, and it would be hard to say, you know, it's hard to deny 101.8, okay? Sure. But uh, the fact of the matter is, is that, Russell's Reserve Single Barrel is a killer expression, and uh, it, it's just an expression that I, I I look for, you know, on a regular basis yeah. in trying to find new, you know, variances and this type of thing. So uh, that's going to be what I would choose is Russell's, Russell's Reserve Single Barrel. That would be my choice. I think that's a pretty solid answer. I'm going <laughs> to <laughs> give you props for that. Um well, that kind of does it for our conversation portion of the of the show. Dave, again, thank you so much for no, having me welcome. tonight, man. I, I want to transition now into uh, our, our review. And this was another sample that, that you sent me as well. This was the Russell's Reserve 2002 that, that just came yes. out this year. And yeah. you, know, you know what? I, I opened that box that you sent me. And I was going, oh, this is so cool and everything. And that was the one that I pulled out where I was like, what the heck? <laughs> I was like, what? what is you weren't it? expecting what? it? <laughs> no, I, I was absolutely not expecting All it right. by, by any means. And, you know, I, I wanted to have this as, you know, part of what I was hoping to, you know, consider in my, you know, best of 2018 and everything. And it got to the point where I was like, ah, that's probably not going to not going to happen and you know you sent me the sample and everything and i was like well now i can you know so you haven't opened it yet no i haven't i haven't tried it it. okay i just just poured the sample that you you sent me all right um so here's the deal um for anybody who has never uh heard the show before or is curious what our review system is like it's a four-tiered system it's nose palette finish and price each category is out of five and then we tally it up for a total score out of 20. And then we let you know whether or not you should, you know, check it out. This is going to be a little bit harder for some people to find right now because it was highly allocated. We'll, yes. We'll it, it, <laughs> very, very small number produced. Um, and I, I believe all the allocations are, are done now. Every once in a while, I'll, I'll see a post on Instagram where someone found some, um, which is kind of unbelievable. Um, they claim to have found them at retail and this is as, as late as last this past week. So it may be out there. Um, well, if you go looking but before we get too far into it too, I want to, um, allow Dave the opportunity to kind of uh, walk us through some of the stats on, on this port. Too. Okay. Well, this is a, uh, limited edition as we had touched on, uh, it was distilled in 2002, uh, bottled in 2018. It's barrel proof. And all the barrels uh, that made up this batch uh, came from Camp Nelson. Camp Nelson is, uh, well, Camp Nelson is a, a national cemetery about an hour away from Wild Turkey. There's rick houses there that Wild Turkey acquired some years ago. Um, and so the barrels pulled for this expression were all from Camp Nelson. And Camp Nelson kind of has its own little unique vibe to it. It's, it's turkey, but it's not turkey. Um, and I think you'll discover that. Um, yeah. But uh, it's uh, non-chill filtered. Uh, and the proof on this one, I don't have it memorized right offhand. So 114.6. Um, so hefty stats here. I mean, this is barrel yeah. proof whiskey. <laughs> um, quite mature um, from a unique set of rick houses. Um, and all, of course, hand-selected by Eddie. Sure. The, I, right off the bat, and this is really unique, but there's something kind of savory on the nose. Yeah, it's different, isn't it? It really is. And what? So one of the um, one of the nosing techniques that I learned from Dixon too was mm-hmm. to go from you know take your nose, put it on the bottom of the glass, and then take it and, and try it with the top of the glass too, furthest away from your mouth. Mm-hmm. And when I when I do that. Like I, when I get to the top of the glass, I lose some of those savory notes and I mm-hmm. start finding like these almost like apricot and a little bit of like green apple notes too, like, like towards the top. It's so. There's know, a lot there. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's so full and, and fruity and floral, but it doesn't overpower some of these like darker notes that are coming through too mm-hmm. um, in, in, in the glass too. And I, you know, clearly that's a product of the fact that it's a freaking 16 year old. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's up there. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, it's, it's technically, I think 15. Um, it just, just was under the 16 year mark. Um, as far as the, uh, you know, distilled the bottle, but close to 16. And, uh, it's, uh, it's very unique. There is something about the Camp Nelson Rick houses. When I, when I did my barrel pick back in September, yeah. um, of course, you know, I did a blind Eddie, you know, we, we decided early on the early on that that was going to be a blind tasting. I didn't know where any of these were coming from, how old they were, nothing. Sure. He poured me, you know, five different samples. Um, one of them I immediately kind of was like, this is just very close to rare breed and didn't have anything kind of unique to it because I wanted something to kind of stand out. You know, sure. Sure. The other four I had to struggle with because it was like they were very close. And the one we ended up going with was just what I felt like was the most unique. They all ended up being from Camp Nelson, all five of them. The one I had wow. kind of put out early on was a, a Camp Nelson A. The one I picked was a Camp Nelson F. And A is very... I say very, it's more true to the typical wild turkey sure. profile. F is just really out there is the best way for me to describe <laughs> it. Is a, it is an out there Rick house. It is, there's something weird going on in F. And even uh, Bruce had uh, mentioned that in the One Nation Under Whiskey podcast. He mentioned that F just had something going on, yeah. strange. So this has some of that in there for sure. So so this is a Rick house F no, this is this is Camp Nelson, so it could be. It's probably a blend of A and F, and possibly right. some other ones. But it's in here. It, it, if you were to taste my selection, this side by side, the 2002 is is notably better. But there is some, <laughs> there are some signature notes there that they share that is not common to the typical wild turkey that you find. Um, sure. Joshua Hatton described it as an industrial type quality. And I think you're going to find it when you have it on the palate. You're not really going to get it on the nose. Well, I'm, I'm curious to find out what it's like on the palate. Can okay. continue. We'll go for it. Yeah. All right. Okay. I see the industrial side of it. There's something different there, right? I, I definitely see that. It doesn't have quite that. Not and and I, I don't mean this in necessarily a bad way, but it doesn't quite have that like natural Right side to it, like that, it, it, that, I, I like that. It, it's there is something different there that mm-hmm. um, it's hard to put a descriptor on, and I think that's Camp Nelson. Uh, yeah, and, and there is a you know Joshua used industrial to describe my single barrel. He wasn't using it to describe 2002, but I think they share some traits of uniqueness, and that's one of them. I think there is this. Like you said, it, it's not so much unnatural. Maybe yeah, it's 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 not natural. It's strange. There is a strange note in there, and uh, it's it's getting it once it gets towards the back of the tongue is when that strange note. Mm-hmm. Comes the finish, it, it, the finish is kind of different, isn't it? It really is. It's kind yeah. of perplexing. I like it. Yeah, I think the finish is really nice and. You know, it, it it's so funny because this is very much like a roller coaster bourbon. Exactly. I mean, even even from the front end, as soon as it starts on the nose, and then it just kind of like goes through all these different motions and and experiences that you find within. Mm-hmm. This is an incredibly complex whiskey. Exactly. And and I, I worry that I by describing these odd notes, the industrial, the unnatural, the diff, this, the unique, this type of thing. I worry that folks are going to think that 2002 is, is not a quality pour, and that, that's not true. No, I think it's very good. It's a, it's a very high-quality pour. It's very different. It's not Russell's Reserve 1998. If you're familiar with Russell's Reserve 1998, similar bottle, different tasting whiskey. Sure. Um, some folks are going to like 2002 better. Some folks are going to like 1998 better. Um, to me, they're both high quality pours. They're both very complex, like you were talking about. Um, but there is something very unique 
with 2002 that you're not going to find in your average wild turkey bottle. I'm so stuck on the savory note that I keep finding on the nose. Mm -hmm. It's almost like, it's almost like bacon. Yeah, I can (laughs) see that. Seriously, it's almost like. like I I described it one time as grease. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Like, like bacon grease. Yeah. I'm totally on board with that. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's like, there's a a peppery grease type of thing going on. Um, How another, odd for a turkey product, though. Yeah, it, it, there is something with those Rick houses at Camp Nelson. I don't know what it is, but there it has these odd and more. Like I said, a and, and I, I, it's not like I've tried every single barrel that's come out of a, <laughs> but but, but the, I've had some store picks that were a Camp Nelson a, and I've had experience tasting you know barrel proof a, and a just seems to be a little bit more of the typical. Wild turkey, like Russell's Reserve 10, rare breedish kind of. The Fs were just all over the map strange. And um, so I, I guarantee you there's some F in this. Um, yeah. Could be something else, another Rick House that I'm not even familiar with. But <laughs> it, it's 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 really good. And I will say that when I first cracked it, um, I had a little bit of pause there because it was so different. I was just like, this doesn't even really taste like wild turkey. Oh, um, the nose doesn't. was there, but it it, it, it just... And, but now that it's opened up, um, I like Russell's Reserve 2002, um, you know, even more so now that it's opened up some. I don't know if I'd really change my review rating. I think it's, I think I rated it appropriately, but uh, I'm discovering new things in it that I, I had not discovered early on. Even, even just sitting here with it, I'm, I'm starting to, to find, find more as it's starting to open up to. Mm-hmm. And there's something really like red berry esque about it as well. That's kind of predominant on the finish. That is mm-hmm. not uh, not necessarily bad. Like a not so ripe strawberry. Something yeah, like that. or, or mm-hmm. kind of a, like a dark cherry. Okay. Like a, like a real cherry, not a maraschino cherry. Mm-hmm. And it, I can get that. Mm-hmm. It's interesting, but it's almost to the point of it being maybe a little bit overpowering. Yeah. On, the finish on the is the, of, of all the phases of 2002, the finish was my least favorite. I, yeah. I kind of have to agree with you on that. It, it has a slight astringency to it. Mm-hmm. It's very slight. I, I equated it to kind of like a pecan shell where you get that kind of bitter when you, when you go to get the pecan out and you get a little bit of the shell and it's kind of yeah. like a little yeah, bitter yeah. there. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not that it's not overpowering. It doesn't dominate it. Mm-mm. But it's there. It's there. Yeah. Um, and I would say that you could try to add water. But when I've done that in the past, it kind of fell apart. I'm like, I'm not going to worry about it right now. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I would leave Maybe. it alone. And, and it, it's good. Um, it's not as good as 1998. I think that. And and honestly, people people hate it when I say this. I think revival's better. I mean, a, a little bit better. I think revival's just. To me, revival is just—I gotta agree with you—a perfect whiskey. It just like everything came together and made this yeah. beautiful whiskey. This is—it's not flawed, but it's there's something there that keeps it from being perfect. Yeah, that's the best way to say it. So, so the we we've kind of talked through. We haven't actually given our scores yet, though, uh, of, of each category. With and the last category too is price. Dave, what's the price on this? Two fifty. Two fifty retail. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. I think that's fair. You think I think so? it's fair, though. Yeah. I, I think it's fair for it, – it, it's a 15-year cast strength, wild turkey. Uh, okay. That's fair. Yeah. You know, it, it's – I mean, look at the NDP releases that you have uh, and their prices, and you don't even know where it came from, you know? And, um, you sure. Know, I, I'm not – and I'm not knocking Dixon. I love Dixon death, uh, but $200 for – 101 proof rye, for example. You need to go listen to my episode with him. Okay. <laughs> I, I need to. I need to. And really I was cool. all on board with batch one, but batch two, I'm just like, it's all over me. It's, I mean, I, I've, I've got it all around in different stores and I just can't come off the 200 bucks. I'm going to let, I'm going to let the man speak for himself. Okay. I okay. don't want to, <laughs> but take that, take that. Okay. Sure. And then, and then say, okay, here you have a, a cast strength 15 year. Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey, you know, for $250 from the actual distillery with Eddie and Jimmy's signature on it. They've signed off on it. 
Um, with a very limited bottle count, you got 3,640 bottles. Yeah. $250 is fair and square, in my opinion. It just is. Sure. Um, so I, I have already written down my my scores Okay. Uh, for this this pour. I'm going to let you kind of walk through uh, number-wise. Uh, okay. Nose palette finish and price for for the listeners too, and I'll, I'll take note of them too as you're, okay. as you're doing that. So, okay, well, on um, using my scale, I would say that the nose is is probably somewhere around a, a four point seven five out of five. Um, the palette would be more like a four point five out of five, and then the finish would be more like a four out of five um, for an average of around four and a half out of five. That would be my personal opinion of it. And and price wise too. I mean, do you have a kind of? I think two fifty. Now I think two fifty is fair. I think for what you're getting, I think two fifty is fair. Um, I wouldn't pay much more than that for it. Um, sure, I would easily pay two fifty for it. I would not pay three hundred, three fifty for it. You know, so so you're kind of in like the sixteen point five range then, and, and yeah, uh, yeah. Well. Uh, Okay, so using your twenty point, I'm going. Scale, I'm going on the twenty point. You're scale, going to twenty. Yeah, okay, so the twenty <laughs> point scale. If I had to give it a, a, a rating in the twenty, I'd say maybe like yeah, seventeen out of twenty or so. Yeah, you know, yeah. If I used your scale, because you I'm factor a, price, and I don't usually fact, factor price in my. I do. Yeah, yeah. Because okay. I, I just kind of like to include like the you yeah. know, What's this gonna? What's That's this fair. gonna set you back if yeah. you know you actually go out and, and purchase this bottle? So I think you're sixteen and a half, seventeen. I think that's fair. Yeah, I was a little bit harsher on it than okay. than you were. Um I I agreed with you though in terms of ranking. Okay. Like the nose was the best part for me. Mm-hmm. I gave the nose a 4 out of 5. I thought that it was different. I thought that it provided some of these notes that you know, you're not typically typically going to find in in turkey products, but just kind of in bur- it, in a, in a bourbon in general, I thought that it was really unique and and different. Palette though was a three point five for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I again thought that it was interesting, but it just kind of lacked a little bit of something that I, I can't quite put my finger on. And I wish I had <laughs> more of this whiskey so I could spend a, a you yeah. know a longer time with it. But my immediate reaction with it is that it's good, but it's it's just missing a little something. But at the same mm-hmm. time, like it's enough goodness and, and enough interesting to push it over like average mm-hmm. i would say so so 3.5 for me there finish though is a little too astringent for me i would say i gave it a 2.5 yeah that's that's fair i yeah. think that's very fair yeah. and and here's the thing about ratings and reviews i think that you have to be honest i think you have to to give your personal opinion you know oh, yeah. exactly how you feel sure. about it for sure. and uh you know, not everyone is going to like 2002. I can tell you that for yeah. sure. It is, it, I, I, honestly, you know, this 2005 Russell Reserve 10 year, I could see many more people liking this more than 2002. I prefer um, it. Yeah. So, it, and that honestly. is not an uncommon thing. No. Um, having a bottle of it, I've, I've grown to appreciate it uh, in a new way. Like I said, I don't think I'd change my score. Um, I just find different things in it than I found when I first opened it. Sure. Um, but if I, if someone just put a big pile of cash in my lap and said, go buy some wild Turkey, it's not <laughs> going to be, it's not going to be on the top of my list. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I think I'd rather have like a dusty the canter. Or, I'd rather have some donuts, yeah. uh, some CGF. Mm-hmm. I mean, Absolutely. I'm just going to be honest with you or I, I'm, here's, here's where I'll be straight honest. There are a few Russell's Reserve single barrel private selections that I've had in the past that yeah. I would love to have tons of if they existed. Um, sure. uh, and, and so it would not be on the top of my list. And I think that your review is fair, very fair. Um, I've seen reviews of 2002 all the way from stellar, unbelievable, oh my God, this is the best whiskey ever made. <laughs> to like, yeah, it's all right. And I kind of fell somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Um, well, pr- price wise, I gave it a 3.5. Okay. I, I I agree with you in that it's, you know, for it being the the age that it is and being as unique as it is, I think that that is enough to kind of again push me past this point of like, you know, am I really going to spend the the money on it? But at the same time, like, 
you know, that some of the quality factors of it would, you know, bump it down a little bit for mm-hmm. me. I think it's fair in the essence of it being what it is at face value. But based on what I, you know, got from it, you know, yeah, I, that that's I, what knocked it back a little bit. For I, could, I could see that because you could pick up something off the shelf like a Russell's Reserve Single Barrel Private yeah. Selection. Mm-hmm. And if it were a stellar selection, and there have been a good many this this year, I'll be honest with you, especially from like Rick House B and D and a few from H. And and you're like, you pay $55, $60, $65 for those. And then you've got Russell's Reserve 2002, and you got to say, hmm, I could get a case of these. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I could get one of these. And I can't fault someone for saying I'd rather have a case of this private selection. I really can't. I, I mean, especially if it's an incredible private selection mm-hmm. and you just absolutely love it. You know, I would probably have to, you know, err on the side of the people who go, yeah, I'd buy a case. I mean, honestly, I would fall in that in that camp. More and I'm going to give you one example. OK, go ahead. <clears throat> and there's two from this year that really. Well, borderline three that have really just really just killed it this year. And I don't want to spoil my review because my next review is one of these. <laughs> Single Cast Nation picked two barrels this year that were stellar, both from K. There was a K off profile barrel that was nine years that was so unique and so classic turkey that, I mean, I just love every bit of it. Yeah. And then this latest one they just released from K, Rick House K, is 10 years, is like this earthy monster that is just smoky and rich and it's just. Considering they normally do scotches, that doesn't surprise me that that's... Well, I'm having a very hard time reeling myself in on the rating. Because, like, (laughs) there was a moment there where I was like, I I might give this a 5 out of 5, and I didn't. Wow. Okay? And I'm not going to say what my score is, but I came very close because there was one night where I was just like, I don't know if you're going to find much better of a barrel than this at Wild Turkey. Sure. Um, And that's just my personal opinion. Um. And then the other uh, would be the master distiller selection that was at the Rick at the uh, I'm sorry the uh, visitor center this year. There was a master mm-hmm. distiller selection that was chosen by Jimmy Eddie, um, uh, Fred No, and uh, Chris Morris. Right, and uh, it was just killer. I mean, just killer barrel. And uh, so, if someone said, "Hey, I've got a case of the master distiller select. I'll trade you for a Russell Reserve 2002," I'd be like, "Done." <laughs> <laughs> I will take that offer. Absolutely. Let's do uh, it. It's, yeah. uh, it's I, great. So, so I gave it a, a 13.5 out of 20 total. Okay. And I, I think that this is a pour that you kind of, I, I recommend trying it. I don't know if I recommend buying it, buying a whole bottle of it, unless you are a. Well, definitely super- don't buy it at secondary. Oh, no, absolutely. Just don't. Absolutely not. I don't. Unless you've tried it and you know what you're getting into. And you think it's amazing. It's a different beast. It's different. Um, So I think that's wisdom. I I, I like that. Oh, thank you. (laughs) You, You're welcome, man. (laughs) Well, that kind of wraps it up for this episode. Um, Dave, again, I want to say thank you so much for hanging out with me. Oh, thank you. It went a little long. I apologize for that. Oh, it's okay. We had a lot to pack in. (laughs) Man, I the longer the podcast the better usually, usually. but okay. you know, I I'm always happy to, you know, hang out, have a good time, share yeah, some yeah. pours and good stories. So, uh where can people find you on social media if they would like to do that? Okay, well, uh my blog is rarebird101.com. Uh plenty of reviews there. There's some other articles and and different resources there. Uh you can find me on Instagram at, at @rarebird101 and you can find me on Twitter at rbird101. And last but not least, I have a Patreon site, which is patreon.com slash rarebird101. And I want to say thank you to all my Patreon supporters because, uh, I, you know what, I, I, I'm going to have to say right now that when I started that that Patreon site, I believe it was in May, you know, I, I thought I might have a little handful of people by the end of the year. And to have 90 patrons today it, it it just it blows my mind, and you guys are just so generous, and I love talking with you, and 
in the posts that you put up on the community and in the comments that you make is just uh it's quite rewarding. It can make a bad day good. So I can have a bad day at work because I have a real job. So I can have a bad day at work <laughs> and I can come home to these awesome community posts or comments and, and it just really makes things great. And then also I, I need to say thank you to my followers on social media, especially Instagram. I have a lot of folks there that that are really are supportive, but um, very, very important to me to, to tell my patrons. Thank you. I'm, one of those patrons too. And you are, I, 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 I have to say it's a really fun community to, to be thank you. And hang out. Of course, man. Um, so definitely go and check that out. Um, if you want to keep up with us on social media, uh, at my bourbon pod, of course, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, uh, post there just about every other day. Um, keeping you updated on everything that's going on. Uh, you can find the podcast, of course, on iTunes and Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Stitcher Spotify, YouTube, all over the place. Uh, five-star rate and review on iTunes, please. That helps us out so much. You can head to bourbonshop.threadless.com if you would like to find our merch and apparel. Uh, we have a sale that I'm going to actually extend until the end of the year um, to continue to celebrate the uh, one-year anniversary of the podcast, of course. Congrats. Hey, thank you, man. I appreciate that. Uh, also, patreon.com slash podcast is where you can find my Patreon page. Which and, I'm a patron, too. Yes, you are a patron. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at everybody who uh, gets early access to this episode actually is because they are patrons and they are watching it being recorded live uh, via Google Hangouts and all that good stuff. So if you would like to have early access to episodes and video reviews and all this kind of good stuff um, that I've been cranking out recently, patreon.com slash my bourbon podcast. Thank you all again so much for listening. Dave, thanks for hanging out with me, man. Thanks Cheers. for the words and everything. Cheers to you too. I think I'm going to have to send you a, 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 a sample flight too. Uh, no, you don't have to, man. No, I, I'm going to do it. All, all right, right. All right. I can't say no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Rare Bird 101, Dave Jennings. Thank you so much for hanging Thank out. you. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Uh, everybody who's listening, thank you all so much. I'll see you next week. But until then, I'm Perry and this is my Bourbon Podcast. 